same person takes the seat. All okay, blue top, blue top. With dark clothing, bar one with. Peter, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. And um, perhaps you'll forgive me because I know what mental health means to you. Um, and in these challenging times, it's also a passion of mine, having had a couple of pretty catastrophic breakdowns in, in my lifetime. How are you today? Yes. Um, I'm OK, Peter. I've got my system, my the system that's taken me 51 years to learn. <laughs> and yeah. It sees me through thick or thin. That's not to say, and let's not talk about this whole situation because we get in trouble with YouTube for, for uh, speaking about such things, but it's not to say that um, it's not an awful time and it's, it's, it's more awful for some than others, obviously. It's going to be fatal for many. And of course, my concern, because I don't care about us old folks, we've had our, um, you know, we've had a blast on this planet. But it's it's the youngsters, isn't it? It's the children and where their future's going. And the freedoms that I enjoy to fly around the world at, at will, you know, basically get drunk in 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 85 different countries. Um, all that's being taken away from them. And, and like I said, I don't want to go too political because otherwise I've just got to edit it out because um, yeah, there, there's certain rules on this platform and, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Tem temporarily, I hope. I think there's, um, I think there's brighter days ahead. Yes. Let's, let's, let's look to that. And uh, you know, the, the, the brightest days you can create are by, doing it in your head and learning to get a control on on those things that make us unhappy isn't it those thoughts that that make us unhappy um i'm working on the theory that your mental health is very much tied into your physical well-being um yes and no peter i think it's very important people realize your paradise is in here and if you eat well you don't actually need to do a massive physical load every, you know, a bit of gentle exercise is great. The reason I say that is you don't want exercise to become your crutch. Otherwise, it just becomes one other thing that when it's taken away from in your in your life, which inevitably at some point it, um, you know, it, it might well be you don't want to then crash because you'd put all your eggs in, you know, into this, this um, athletics basket. So I like to think I'm, I'm in paradise from the moment I wake up. It's in my head. Um, I'm very grateful for this life. I, I, yeah, I'm just very grateful for this life. And I, I think that's just a starting block for not complaining it, you um, see, that's really interesting what you say there, because I, I, I give you 10 years, unfortunately. Um, but when I was your age, um, I was still doing 10 Ks regularly. So I'd do a couple of training runs a week for them. And then at the weekend, I'd go and do uh, a 10 K. And I've never been an athlete. I'm too, too, too broad and too heavily boned to, to be a great runner of any description. But I enjoyed it and I did it. And of course, I was always setting myself targets. I had to beat the hour, um, you know, and then if I got to 59 or 58 or 57, then then so be it, you know. Um, but now, now I'm coming up to 61. Um, I need to uh, preserve my hips, preserve my knees. I'm a bit broad around the waist. And, I, and I've stopped running, essentially, because, you know, my performances were tailing off and I found that the aches and pains were not a decent payoff. But... I've replaced that with walking um, and, and, and I, you know, I'm not power walking, race walking, you know, invariably with a member of my family, we're having a bit of a stroll, but I still get as much of a buzz out of that because 
we try to find new places to go and walk when it's possible, when it's daylight at the weekend. And I find that the, the kind of buzz that I get from seeing new places, experiencing new things, even though it's a gentle stroll around some woodland or a park or through a forest for maybe an hour, hour and a half, and I'm not doing it fanatically every day, that kind of works for me. It's still, I'm still absorbing new information. So that's keeping the old gray matter ticking over. And that in turn, I think impacts upon my, my mental health and helps keep that in check. I think that's wonderful, wonderful, mate. Definitely. You know, there's beauty in everything, isn't there? If you just look for it, you know, we, 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 I think we've been conditioned most of our lives to just take everything for granted and expect you know, expect to have this pay packet at the end of the year, this car, this holiday, this, you know, these clothes, then I'm, then I'm going to feel like this when I've got all this, then, I, then I'll be good. And, and I think people are ever more realizing, or certainly a lot of people are that, no, it's, it's, you know, appreciate what you've got, appreciate this beautiful planet, even if it's a stroll around the park and I mean, even just feeding the ducks now would be something that <laughs> I would, I'd treasure that, you know, yeah. Um, especially with my son but but even just just myself um what i would say is i'm very passionate about uh what i god i don't want to get into one here because it's really hard to explain in a little sound bite and then people get confused and think you're talking about something that you're not but i've eaten alkaline now or i've kept my body alkaline for for, for the best part of 20 years so I never get sick, you know, I've, I've had a, a spinal condition, but that's related to my time in the military and um, damage that was done there. Excuse me. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> and again. You don't get that on the Joe Rogan show. <laughs> <laughs> um, which probably was then compounded by sitting in, in a chair a lot. And I'm still sort of you'd say partially disabled now I, i'm i'm in um what what comes under the definition of chronic pain which is never ending pain it doesn't go away right but that's not a whinge I'm, I'm i'm just pointing pointing that out but putting that to one side as far as all the other bits and bobs go um yeah i seem to do all right and i'm wary of I'd be wary, Peter, of having like dairy in my diet because I know it causes joint problems and bone problems and um, abundance of meat causes over acidity in the body. So then your, 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 your precious bones that you only get one set of are being subjected to acid every day. And I do wonder, the point I'm getting to, <laughs> there is a point to this, is, you know, when you see these elderly let's just say an elderly man in a village in Africa or, 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 or let's just say an eye Africa is not a good example because they eat this porridge in sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, they certainly did in Mozambique when I worked there and it's supplied to them by the, the Yanks. So they call it Chima and it's what we would call Sam Samalina and it's the staple of their diet. And they'll just eat this one. They only have, one meal a day there um and they they'll put a spoon of a very weak broth like it might be some goat broth or something and it's it's just a trickle of gravy on top of this chima and that's all they eat so that's not a good example of good health but i've seen these elderly men on these polynesian islands that they've lived in the nature of their whole lives or live the natural way and they're like 85 years old and they look like they're 60 or, or 55 or something. Right. So going back to the diet thing, I wonder if you have that pure diet eating in line with what, what our ancestors would have done when we were hunter gatherers, how, how long you could keep up running the marathons. Well, my mum's 92. She's on two new knees that she had, she had one done when she was, 85 and one done when she was 86 she toddles around on those she was evacuated during the war as a child and lived on 
whatever they could lay their hands on. Not the most healthy diet, lots of sort of lard and fat and that kind of stuff involved in the cooking. And uh, But thereafter, she's she's been a model of moderation. And consequently, she's mentally super alert, you know, toddles around happily on her knees and is quite frankly remarkable. Um, sadly, I'm not a model of moderation. I've not exactly followed her example. Um, but yeah, she she she's in great shape. So I I I, I guess, you know, there, there, there may be elements of all those from Chima to my mum's diet to whatever else works for people. Um that and, and what clearly works for you and enables you to keep up your fitness levels. Yeah. It's it diet's not a difficult one for me because I battled addiction so much in my life or I've or maybe I've lived with it is probably a better expression. That's so much harder than most other things in life. So giving up sugar in my tea is that's, 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 you know, that's no great. <laughs> that's not a big challenge for me, you know, saying no to a dessert. I, I phase in, I, I phase between all these, various addictions peter one day it's alcohol the next day it is food you know another day i find myself drinking coffee again and it's but through this whole process of constant improve attempts at improvement i i i'm quite good at micromanaging it all now and um keeping the bad stuff to a minimum and the the green stuff so the good diet to um yeah, to, to quite a good routine. Let's talk about the police, though, because the the detectives, I mean, drinking culture is 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 infamous, isn't it, in in that line of work? Oh, it, it very much was back in my day, both in uniform as well. Um, we used to particular we do there was a regular shift pattern that re repeated itself every four weeks. And uh, at one point you do seven night duties on the bounce. So 10 PM to 6 AM for seven consecutive days. Then you'd have a quick changeover, come quick changeover, come back on at 2 PM and do two late turns. So a nine night and day stretch. Well, you can imagine at the end of that ninth shift, 2 PM till 10 PM, when you've done seven nights and two late turns, you've had no kind of social life whatsoever, barely seen anybody other than your colleagues because most of the human race were asleep while you were working. You get to 10 o'clock on that Tuesday of that late turn. And what did you want to do? Go and let off some steam, you know, and the whole question was, you know, which publican is going to give us a lock in tonight? You're in the pub not long after 10 and the publican would understand you've just come off a nine day stint um, during which you would invariably have been very, very busy and dealt with plenty of nastiness and, and the such like. And yeah, the doors were locked. You know, the public kicked out, the doors locked and you would get on it. Mm. Um, so much so that because you were off the following day, if you carried on till 4am in the morning and you still fancied it well the markets started opening up like Covent Garden and and they would have pubs that, that opened at four five six o'clock in the morning so you would just go on an almighty great one um but yeah in as a detective as well I became a detective in 1982 yeah drinking was very much a part of the culture if you were late for an early morning spin, a search, you were for the high jump and your fine wouldn't be what it is now in modern day policing, which is donuts or other forms of cakes. It was a bottle of whiskey or a crate of beers or both. And it would get to five, six o'clock in the evening. And if the DI, the detective inspector, decided that the whiskey was coming out of the bottom drawer, then it did. And you'd sit around, have a catch up, have a drink, and then go to the pub. But of course, in those days, you would meet informants in pubs. 
and people would know that you were a detective from the local CID office. And it was not an uncommon thing for somebody to sidle up to you when you're in the pub having a drink and say, excuse me, I'd like to have a chat. And you might sneak off to the loo, the car park, round the back of the boozer, go for a little stroll, find a little nook or cranny in the pub where you could sit down and not be overheard. And it would be quite remarkable what you would learn about crime or criminals. Um, and, and yeah, so it was it was seared into the culture, that whole drinking thing. And I was very much a part of it. Mad, isn't it, to think in those days, and this is like when I was, you know, a young man, you, you could go out at lunchtime from your job and go to the pub, then you went back to work. Yeah, well, in those days, the, the pubs were open from 11am till 3pm, and then they close and reopen at 5pm. So, yeah, you go and have lunch, have a couple of beers and, and go back to the office for the afternoon and look at your watch, wait for five o'clock to come around if there was, you know, if, you, if your work was done and off you go. And then, of course, when I went into undercover work, which started in the, the mid 1980s, so many of the meetings that I had with villains, criminals, gangsters, when I was persuading them that I was one of them and we were negotiating to buy drugs or guns or counterfeit currency or stolen goods or any other kind of counterfeited high value nicked gear um very often it would be in a pub or maybe a hotel bar or a restaurant where of course drink would be involved now of course you had to be very careful because when you're chatting with these gangsters the last thing you want to be is not fully aware you want your peripheral vision working you want to be on it I mean, and the adrenaline is really, really helping with that because it's kicking in massively. In fact, you had to almost try and combat that so you didn't look like you were too wired. Um, and, and likewise, you know, if drugs were involved during the, the negotiations, I would only ever partake as a very, very last result because I wanted to be on it. I wanted to be aware. I wanted my peripherals and my hearing and my all around awareness to be absolutely bang on because it was a pretty high risk business. Mm -hmm. All these TV programs are coming into my mind with you saying all this, Peter, what, what was there one particular TV program that, that you guys really liked because it was representative or, or were they all, I'm thinking the Sweeney, obviously. Yeah, well, when I was in the, in the, in fact, when I was at the training school at Hendon, um, the Sweeney was on in those days in 1978, and the television room was absolutely rammed every night the Sweeney was on. And it was great. You know, they had very good sources that were tipping, the, tipping them the wink about what life was like on the flying squad, on the Sweeney. Um, and and it, was, it was wonderful. You know, John Thor and Dennis Waterman gave brilliant performances as did many other actors and it was that leather jacketed rufty tufty hard drinking womanizing kind of detective world that that i was a part of um so that was really great but many years later after i i retired from the police when i got medically retired i was kind of on a scrap heap of life and wondering what i was going to do with myself and I got a contract to write my autobiography, The Gangbuster. And that got published in 2000 or 2001 and got picked up by a TV production company who were making a show for the BBC called Murphy's Law. Now, they'd had two series of this drama show. Uh, James Nesbitt played an undercover cop called Tommy Murphy. Yeah. And they had two series... But the BBC had said to the production company, this is really going to have to change here or else the show's days are numbered. They had like a writer's room, a group of writers that would contribute to the series. And one of them bought and read my autobiography and said to the production company, if we're making a show about undercover cops, you've got to get this bloke on board. They tracked me down. I went and had a, had a meeting with all the big cheeses 
from the production in a restaurant. It was quite ironic. I uh, I walked, we met on the in a restaurant on the first floor of a restaurant and I walked in and there's this oval table with about 11 people sitting around it, right? And an empty chair for me. So I'm introduced to everybody and I'm trying to take in as many names as to who's an exec producer, director, producer, writer, script editor, all this kind of stuff. And it's largely going over my head because, you know, I come from a world of law enforcement. I'm not a fluffy TV type. And here I am thrown into this environment. Anyway, I sit down. The first woman to speak is on my right hand side and she's a script editor and clearly comes from a background where the police might not have been her favourite organisation. And the very first thing that she said to me, she said, have you actually read your book? And I turned around and said, I wouldn't read that fucking shit if you paid me. And, f- and, and from that point we're on, we got on famously, and I was literally talking to her on the phone a couple of nights ago. You know, we've become lifelong friends and and it just took off from there i did i was employed as a story consultant um, on the show we did three more series it was very warmly received it um it won an irish bafta it got nominated for the uk bafta for best drama and decommissioned in the same week would you believe it so that's the bonkers world of television for you. Nominated as best drama and decommissioned, like just lunacy. But it was a great experience for me. I read so many scripts from so many different writers and worked very closely with them that it's really helped me in my writing since then, you know, and is part of the reason why I've had three radio plays commissioned by Radio 4, and I've written those because I learned how to to write drama and to to construct dialogue and and all of that. Plus spending a lot of time on set, which has been helpful on other TV projects. And it was a a, a remarkable experience that I never ever dreamt I would have had when I was sitting in some scummy boozer negotiating to buy a few kilos of cocaine from some lunatic gangster with a nine mil down the back of his trousers. Mm. It was a, a so it was quite a journey, but I so we really loved that show because I spent a lot of time with Jimmy Nesbitt, you know, teaching him the very essence of undercover policing, and he really got it. You know, he threw himself into it, really got it, and I thought he delivered a a, a magnificent performance across those three seasons, which were which were very different from how the show had been. It had been a bit cartoon caricature before that. You know, one week you'd be a nurse and the next week you'd be a brain surgeon and, and that kind of stuff till we got on board it and um, made it what it was. Yeah, I do remember. I think I remember the, the well, not the trailers, what do they call it? The first one that goes out, the, the whatever you call that. And uh, was a bit cliche from what I remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, we certainly, uh, we certainly got on board all that, you know, in the next three series. Um, were were as close, I think, as you could get a drama to it. You know, of course, at some points, I would just have to let the writers go with it. You know, there was no point being pedantic and saying it wouldn't happen like this, it would happen like that. Um, It's a drama at the end of the day. You know, so you can anchor it in reality, but that anchor has to slip from time to time. So you can drive the storytelling forward. You know, it's kind of made me chuckle this week that it ends up with a government minister talking to a TV production, this this show called The Crown, which I've not seen, and saying they should put some kind of proviso up at the start of it, saying this is a drama, you know, and not a documentary. And you've got government ministers interfering with all that kind of stuff. If you can't tell the difference between a drama and a documentary, that's a little concerning. <laughs> yes. It's interesting you say, as an author, I've learned an awful lot about life, certainly about um, scripts. And one of the things it's brought home to me is the indiscretions when you watch television programmes. Yeah. For I mean, a silly example, guy walks into a room and there's a, a hammer on the side 
and I'll, I'll turn to my girlfriend and say, someone's going to get killed with that hammer in a minute. How do you know? Because it's just a random object that wouldn't be there and, and they're going to contrive something now where the guy then has to pick it up and just, just it, it, it's an author thing. You, you can see where they're trying to make. To that end, Peter, um, maybe I should offer you an apology first. I didn't watch your TV series. The, the, the Wanted. Hunted. Hunt, I'm so sorry, Hunted. I You're telling me you didn't watch it. You don't even know the bloody name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't do, you didn't do another one called Wanted, did you? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> but I should, I should um, in all fairness, I, I don't really watch a lot of main, mainstream media. I know there's only one, one series that I've traditionally watched for the last 20 years um, or in the last 20 years. So I'm not probably the best person to talk to about. Well, you've got to tell me what that is then. What do you watch? Um, purely, and I'm defending myself here from a psychological perspective, we watch I'm a Celebrity. Oh, okay, right. And the reason I watch, it's two things really. Well, it's lots of things. One, it's really rewarding to know that, as a person, you're not an utterly useless wanker like all these celebrities seem to be. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't have a week away from your family without pissing your pants. What what is that about? It's it's just it's cr coming from a military person. It's just crazily insane. When you go away on deployment for five months and you got people trying to kill you, yeah, and then you got people that can't be away from their you know four year old for three days without having an emotional breakdown it, 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 it I, I'm not knocking it I get it of course I get it I, you know we're, we're all different I get that but I like the fact that they come in there and they're all soft around the edges and they're all arguing with each other and by the time they come out of it they form this cohesive team and they talk and they understand and they make allowances and people that weren't doing anything in the beginning are now saying, right, I'll do that. And the people that were scared of a spider have, have just realised, actually, that's when it comes to survival and food, it's all in my head. You know, th these are just luxuries that we have in Western society. We're allowed to be scared of a spider. Um, no disrespect to people that have got phobias. I, 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 I un understand how horrible that, that is. But so that's the one thing. Peter, right? We, I allow myself. I'm a celebrity once, once a year when it comes around. But with respect to Hunted, I'd be watching it and I'd be going, "Well, that ain't right." They would have been caught by now. They would. This would have done. And I might be completely wrong. And I, and if I if I am, I apologise. So, how how kind of realistic was it? if you're allowed to say and how much of it was kind of made for the made for the cameras it's available on all four so you can pop in and have a watch whenever you fancy it okay well i, I did six series of hunted i did four of the main show and two of the celebrity versions and i had a great time it is a very heavily regulated show for a couple of reasons number one there is a vast sum of money available for anybody who evades capture, you know, a share of £100,000. So you can imagine that Ofcom, the regulator, are all over it like a rash, and rightfully so. Another reason is that when a fugitive gets caught, they, quite understandably, say to the producers, show me the A to Z of how I got caught. What did the hunters do so that I got caught? Because they're aggrieved. They've just lost out on that chance of winning the money. And they want to know how we, as the hunters, managed to capture them. Because so many of them actually think they've done everything perfectly right. And, you know, it comes as a, a big shock to them. Thirdly, the show, of course, has two sides to it. The fugitives and the hunters. The only people that sit across both sides of the show so that they know what's going on 
with both fugitives and hunters are the series referee, who was a retired, very senior police officer. And essentially, his decisions are ultimately binding on everybody. And the exec producer. So they're the only people that know what's going on. Nobody else is privy to what the other side is doing. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely right, of course. Because if the show didn't have any integrity, I would have walked out of it on day one. If there was any element of a construct, a fiddle, a nonsense, you know, at the end of the day, I might not have much of a reputation, but it's my reputation, and I'm not going to sacrifice it for an entertainment programme. And so it was very heavily regulated. Um, and that really is what made captures so very rewarding. You know, every time... Now, of course, there is the power of the edit, right? So the show will be edited to build the tension so that it's pacey and it builds to a crescendo and all of that. But, of course, the edit is nothing to do with us. We just work 12 hours a day for 28 or 25 days or 14 days in the celeb version, knocking ourselves bandy, trying to find them all the time with a camera in our faces, which adds another kind of level of, of, of stress sometimes. And there has been a cameraman on more than one occasion or, you know, female camera operator who's been told to... Um, let's just say, go away for a moment. Um, you know, so it's bang on. I, I see all the nay naysayers I used to talking about fix and all that kind of nonsense. And that is exactly what it is. Absolute nonsense. A lot of people had a bit of a meltdown when we captured all of the fugitives, which was on the last series that I was a part of. And quite frankly, that was the, the result of three or four days of absolutely brilliant investigative work, teamwork, investigative work that led us to identify that car park where the helicopter was going to land. And consequently, the last two or three fugitives that were making way, we knew they had to be making their way there. And, uh, and we were able to pick them off. And it was a great, great victory for us. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Many people hated it because they were on the side of the fugitives. But we, as hunters, you know, I was unashamedly party pooper in chief. That was my job, <laughs> you know, to rain on people's parade. And we did that magnificently, caught them all. And that was a considerable part of, of why I decided to, to leave the show in the end. You've got me all excited now to, to, to watch the series. Yeah, I've ruined, see, I've ruined the end of series four for you, I'm afraid. I but, don't uh, you can see all the other series. And it, it, it was it was a cracking show, and it was fabulous to be a part of something which so many millions of people enjoy. Yeah, I should say that I literally get about 40 minutes of an evening, normally around nine o'clock, to finally just watch some TV to calm down. That's when I finish work. It's gone nine o'clock every night. So it's... It's not like I have loads of time to watch watch a lot of television if people are wondering, but but I will make it a priority to watch some of these ever. I'm quite excited to now. What's the um what's the thing then, Peter, that doesn't just stop one of these fugitives, you know, jumping in a cupboard for whatever the time is? Well, somebody living in a cave for 25 days is not gonna make great television um so you know you, you would have to be a fool um not to understand that there are i'm sure conditions placed upon the fugitives yeah you know they sign a contract same as we sign a contract but as i always said when i was the chief it is not our job to investigate that we are here to find the fugitives so anything that would be pursued, perceived by me or anyone from the production as being underhand, for example, going into a fugitive's previous email threads and trying to find out what the conditions of their contract would be, would be cheating as far as I'm concerned. 
Mm. And I'm sure the referee would see it that way. And that person's involvement in the show would be <clears throat> very rapidly brought to an end, I'm sure. So uh, there was there was none of that. Yeah. And we, I... and, we, and we stuck to the rules very, very rigidly. If it was 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., when 8 p.m. came, computer shut down. End of. Yes, we might go for a drink, but there is no getting on your phone and researching out of hours. That is cheating. Absolutely. And I will not tolerate it. Because once again, it comes back to our reputations, our credibility. And a lot of the hunters, you know, both on the ground and in HQ, are currently involved in law enforcement, you know, or the commercial security sector. And, and, and they have, you know, glittering personal and professional reputations, of course. Mm. So I never had to tell anybody twice. We all just knew it and we all just got it. You imagine a serving cop on Hunted, you know, gets found to have cheated or something. What kind of journey is he going to have next time he goes to the old Bailey and stands in the witness box yeah. on a murder trial? Uh, but we've seen you cheat on telly and you're trying to convince the jury that what you're telling us now is the truth. You know, so. Well, yeah. all this came around. I don't, I, I'm, I, I don't know if you remember, Peter, or whether we've got the same understanding of it, but it was the Bear Grylls thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there was, yeah, there was Bear Grylls. And then, of course, SAS Who Dares Wins, I think, came out around about the time that Hunted started. It was the, uh, yeah, for our friends at home that are wondering what, what we're talking about, it was, huh. it was the fact that Bear would pretend to do these stunts. And had he just said, listen, folks, I'm doing this for the camera. Obviously, I'm not going to sleep inside a camel for 24 hours, right? Pete, I'm sure people would have gone, okay, still fascinating. But, but by lying to people and pretending that they were actually, you know, live in this survival lifestyle and and um i mean there's one scene where he throws himself in a river and you can clearly see under his thing he's got a life jacket on he's got a big life and as oh, i really? say as yeah. i say we're all adults we all get it you, you've got tv they've got health and safety they can't have the guy drown but but just say that instead of treating people like it you know this it's this whole whole thing of this modern generation just gets treated like idiots all the time. Everyone wants your money. Everyone wants just to, just to sort of lead you down a garden path. And, and I think that where it came to light was when he was filmed staying in a hotel when he was supposed to be sleeping under a pine tree or something. Right. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And, yeah. um, it, it was quite funny then because then they edited the show and they had a big scene at the beginning going, some of these scenes have, have been presented to Bear so he can demonstrate his survival skills, right? That was their, their kind of caveat to their get out of jail free card, right? The problem was they hadn't edited the show accordingly. So Bear would set a trap. He'd come across this rabbit in the trap which we now know has been placed in the trap by the, by the TV production crew. Cause they told us at the beginning of the show and you've got Bear Grylls going, Oh my God, I've got one. Wait, wait. And there's this poor dead rabbit in the trap that he's pretending is still alive or whatever. And he's like, right. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and it's like, Bear, Bear, your, your producers just told us all this is made up and, and you're just insulting our intelligence now. <laughs> and sorry, I take things like that quite serious. I'd rather just be, it depends what it is, you know, actors in a movie don't, aren't gonna come and say, hi, I'm an actor. That would that would kind of ru ruin stuff, but. We see in Hunted, there is a, a rider that goes out at the start of the show in as much as that it says some of the CCTV or automatic number plate recognition, AMPR, might be replicated for the purposes of the show. And that's absolutely right. But you see, that data is gathered by the, the referee and his team. And so, because the state, 
might not necessarily, or private system holders might not necessarily allow us for very valid GDPR reasons and more would not allow us access to that data. So what the referee and his team do is they replicate that data. So they've got a map of all the AMPR cameras in the country. So they know if a fugitive is in a car and it goes through an area where an AMPR camera is, they can tell by their map if they would have triggered that camera. So if we as hunters make an application to the referee and it's justified and it's lawful and it's proportionate and the referee will test all of that. If we make that application and say, can we have data from that AMPR camera at this location on this date and at this time, if the referee accepts our application and he knows a fugitive was in a car that went past that AMPR camera at that stage, they then may give us a, ro a load of data with it hidden in there somewhere and we would have to try and find it like you would in real life, just like you would in real life. And likewise, the embedded producer directors that are with the fugitives are making a TV show. So they're filming them most of the time. Mm. So if a fugitive walks down a high street and the, the embedded producer director is filming them walking down that high street, if we think they've been to that high street, and yet again, we make the application and it's lawful, proportionate, justified, and the referee agrees with it, and we've nominated the right place at the right time, we may get that footage. Mm. So that's how it works. But it's completely, you know, straight down the line. Um, but, you know, there's always, you know, in an age of fake news, conspiracy theories, and Bear perhaps staying in a hotel, it's not surprising that conspiracy theories sometimes abound and... Um, and people look on things very, very sceptically. But, you know, so be it. Water off a duck's back to me. So, Peter, what um, what kind of impressive things did your fugitives get up to to, to evade capture? What, was there anything that was particularly remarkable? Yeah, in series two, I think it was, uh, a lovely fella called Nick Cummings, who actually won, he and another guy called uh, Io Adesina won. And they each walked off with 50 grand. Nice work if you can get it. Um, Nick Cummings conducted a brilliant deception on us, whereby he got a decoy, you know, dressed like him, identical clothing and all of that, and led, a, uh, and led us a trail of deceit, which we had to follow. We had no choice. You know, there were some people who were sceptical about it, and I'm not detracting from Nick because it was a brilliant decoy. And, and by and large, you know, we, we fell for that. Um, in series one, the remarkable Dr. Ricky Allen, who was uh, irascible and, you know, a bit grumpy and kind of had his own particular take on the world, but a man who uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for. He laid a false trail up in the wilds of Scotland. Um, and actually... He was tucked away watching us follow that false trail. You know, so some people did some really kind of inventive sort of uh, things along the way. And so often we felt we were compelled to follow these trails. Um, and, and sometimes they were decoys, they were wrong, and they made us look a little bit foolish. Mm. And, uh, and that's all great, of course. So if they were to use a bank card in would you be able to say, right, if we were the, you know, real police here now, we'd be able to access that transaction? Is that yeah, how? if 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 we if we knew that, that they had a card, yeah. you know, we'd have to know the card details. We'd have to know the bank account details. So we have to find all those things out. You know, you can't simply, like in real life, go to a bank and say, you know, can if anybody called John Smith uses their bank card, bank card, can you tell us? No, you've got to identify the account and you have to have a flag put on that account so that when the card goes into the machine, it will trigger that flag and we will get notified. But once again, the referee, the referee would feed in that notification at 
the identical sort of time as to how you would get it in real life if it was a police investigation. Mm. Now, I'll give you an example on um, CCTV, if I may. For, for, um, if you take King's Cross Railway Station in London, right? It's got about 15, 16 platforms. So you imagine how many CCTV cameras are in that station. 15 platforms, say, vast concourse, numerous shops. That's just inside the building, yeah? Then think of the outside of the building, which, again, is swamped by multiple CCTV cameras. If we put an application into the referee that said, we believe the fugitive Joe Bloggs was at King's Cross Station on Monday the 1st of December, then the referee would say, well... That's hundreds of CCTV cameras. It will take a team of people days to look at all that footage. Mm. So in essence, you're not going to get it because in practical terms, you wouldn't get it. All right, if maybe it was a terrorist suspect who'd let off a device and killed many people, you know, some ghastly thing like that, and they were on the run, then maybe the police resources would be able to throw a team at it, shall we say. But in normal kind of circumstances, say for a homicide investigation, you're not going to have those resources, I'm afraid. That's just the harsh reality. However, if our application says we believe, and of course we would have to refine our investigation and narrow it down. If we said our fugitive, we believe, was on platform 14 or 15 between 10.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. that day, then, of course, they'll go, right, that's one operator to look at four cameras for a half-hour span. It might take half a day and you'll get the result. You know, completely different kind of kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, and, and that was how it was run, and that, and that was absolutely right. Let's go back to your undercover days, Peter, if we may, because this, gosh, there's absolutely fascinating I, I mean i the things that are coming into my mind that i'd i'd want to ask someone if i had this chance is when did the the uh, i was going to say ira but it's obviously not just the ira it's the ira and the um and the uda and the the loyalist paramilitaries when, when did that start becoming an issue was that was that while you were serving or was that before you before you became a detective well i mean as a i was born in 1959 right so as a as a teenager born and raised in a london suburb who traveled into central london all the time on the trains and the tubes i grew up looking for unattended bags on trains I still do it now. You know, those atrocities, those campaigns are seared into my head. I was working as a detective on B Division at Kensington when the bomb went off at Harrods, you know, and killed colleagues. God, I remember that and, now, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we were, we were, I was not only born and raised, but then entered a police force as it was then, which was at the very forefront. Of, of all of that, mm. albeit I never served on counterterrorism, wasn't really my, my bag. Um, but of course, the catastrophic stint that I spent in witness protection program, so towards the end of my undercover career, was all sparked by the fact that the people that supplied an enormous amount of heroin to me, uh, 15 kilos, which at the time was the biggest landside seizure of heroin ever in the UK. I know it's all been dwarfed now, but that's how it was back in the day in 92 or 93, whenever that operation was. Um, those guys, it was proven that they were very, very closely linked to a terrorist organisation, so much so that they said if we didn't want to pay them 
the hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of pounds that we were going to pay them for the drugs, so they thought, we could pay them in weaponry, um, which gives you a very clear indicator as to who they were connected with and what kind of campaigns they were doing. Now, when that job all went horribly wrong, um, and if, in other words, all the, all the, so they brought the drugs, this guy brought the drugs to me at the hotel at Gatwick. I spent hours weighing and testing these 30 parcels. He and I walked off to the bar to have a celebratory drink, as he thought, you know, to, 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 to toast the start of a very long and lucrative business arrangement. That's what he's thinking, because that's what I'm telling him is going to be. We get to the lift, out come the armed police, throw us to the ground, handcuffed us, all of that, carted off. Other people were simultaneously arrested around the UK at locations where money was going to be handed over um, and other locations, people that have been involved in the negotiations and the transportation of the, the drugs, the heroin and all of that. So they all get scooped up. And then two or three days later, they are all gathered together in the dock in a court charged with this very, very large drug conspiracy. And, of course, they're all looking around and they're going, where's that cocky South Londoner with the ponytail? In other words, yours truly. Mm. And, of course, I'm not in the dock with them. And so they pretty quickly realised that I must have been an undercover cop. And they worked on the theory that if they killed me, they killed the evidence. And to a large part, they were absolutely right. Now, at that stage, it wasn't an issue because, you know, being threatened and all that goes with the territory. And besides, they, they didn't know my real name. They didn't know where I lived. So I could carry on working undercover and all that kind of stuff, as long as I was careful not to infiltrate another part of their organisation. So it's all fine, not a problem. Being threatened was, you know, goes with the territory when you do that kind of undercover work or, or many kinds of police work. Anyway, um, things kind of progress, not brilliantly. They discover the plot to kill me. The FBI discover it on a phone tap in a bar in Boston, Massachusetts. And the FBI hear the code name for the assassin. He was a doctor, not very original. And the weaponry was the doctor's bag, and that's how they referred to it. You know, have you seen the doctor today? Did he have his bag with him? Blah, 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 blah. Um, so we know it's a very, very real thing because the feds have told us. Then this is where my whole life began to unravel. It was a very complex operation. It involved the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency in the States, the FBI, as you've heard, the Garda Shikana, the Irish police in Southern Ireland, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, as they were then, um, Her, Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, as they were called then, and, of course, us, the police. And there was a lot of kind of infighting between these various organisations, as there so often is, about who's got primacy and ownership of the investigation and all, all that kind of stuff. The kind of nonsense that, you know, I was so glad I was never really a part of because it always just irritated the the shit out of me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Deputy Commissioner of the Police wants a report compiled um, detailing everything that has gone on so that he is very well briefed when he goes into battle with the customs and the feds and all of that kind of stuff. Now, this report was compiled by a detective sergeant on the team that were dealing with the arrests and the prosecution. And for some reason, which still remains a mystery, all these years later, he put my real name in that report. I have a very unusual surname, Blexley, B-L-E-K-S-L-E-Y. There's only about 14 Blexes in the country, and I've fathered most of them. Well, no, 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 only three of them. Um, but, you know, my, what should have gone in there is my code number, which is allocated to me by the undercover unit of the yard. But he puts my real name in it. I've got the report in, on my shelves behind me. And my name re is repeated on virtually every page. That report is then printed off and taken out of police premises, which it shouldn't have been. It's put in a briefcase, which goes in the back of the police car 
you know, the, the, the plain clothes police car, that he's going to drive home that night. It should have been kept a lot more securely than that. He then goes bloody shopping. Come on, you know the rest. You know what happens next. Yeah, 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 yeah. That car gets broken into, right? And that report gets stolen. So now there's a distinct possibility that those who want to kill me, as identified on the FBI phone tap, could be in possession of that report and know my real name in which case I would be very easy to find and therefore assassinate. So I get a phone call when I'm driving home from work one night. Don't go home. Don't go home. Were well, you going to tell me why not? No. Just book into a hotel using one of your false undercover identities because I always had a, had a couple of those on the go and prepared and ready for any operation I was going to go off and do. Get your girlfriend to pack an overnight bag and be in here at Scotland Yard tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. Well, the girlfriend and I sat in this hotel all night going, what's all this about? And of course, I didn't have a clue. Did not have a clue. I didn't get to the yard at nine o'clock. Of course, I'm a detective. I got there at eight. And my mate pulls me aside and he goes, have you seen this? And he holds up the report. I said, no. He said, right, there's a copy for you to read. And he said, and there's a copy for you to put in your pocket because I think you're going to need it. And he locks me in a side room, tiny little pokey sort of office. And I read it. Could not believe what I was reading. To think that this is now potentially in the hands of criminals, coupled with the fact that we know about the, the plot to kill me, this is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. Mm. And by the close of play that day, the bosses at Scotland Yard had decided that I had to abandon my home, abandon my identity and my life as I knew it, and move into the witness protection programme. And so began a catastrophic two-year stint. Gosh. What do they do when you're in the witness? Is it like we see on the, you know, on in the films? False identity, new, new house and all this sort of stuff? Yep. Yeah, all of that. But they hadn't really thought it through because these circumstances had never arisen before. And it was quite frankly ludicrous. I mean, I would wake up in the morning in this hideout because that's what it was. It wasn't a home. It was a hideout. You know, it was given a lick of paint and uh, a bit of remedial building work before me and my girlfriend moved in. But it was still a hideout. You know, I couldn't be neighbourly. Talking to the neighbours was the last thing I wanted to do. And that's my normal default position, to be chatty and neighbourly. Because all of a sudden now, if I'm out there mowing the lawn on a Sunday morning and the neighbours say, oh, and where did you come from? Where did you move from? You know, and what do you do? And, you know, all of that, all I'm going to do is layer, lie upon lie upon lie. Mm. And it's all more stuff that I've got to remember and I hated it. And every morning I'm going out to check, make sure some bastard hasn't put a device under my car. You know, and trying to do that discreetly and not alarm the neighbours is a very challenging thing to do. So there I am, every morning, I wake up, come downstairs, and on the doormat is the mail addressed to me in the name that I'm living in, in witness protection. So there you go. There's your constant reminder, first thing in the morning, that you're in a hideout, and that's your false identity. So I get ready. And then I go to work, check the car, as you know. And that used to be my favourite hour of the day because I'd drive to work and I'd put the radio on and I could listen to whatever I wanted to listen to. And for that hour or however long it took me, I would be myself. I would be Peter Blexley. And I'll tell you why that was so important because invariably I'd get into the office and the DI would go, Blex, we've got another undercover job come in. I'd like you to do it. So by half past 11 on any given morning, I've been three different people already. Three different identities. You know, I've got this constant concern about, well, why was my name in the report? How was it taken out of the building? How was it stolen? You know, what's going on here? Is there something I'm not being told? Mm. So I've got all that going on. It was dark days during policing. There was plenty of corruption going on, which I was being made privy to, and people coming to me worried for their lives and all that kind of stuff. And perhaps not surprisingly, 
I drank and I drank and I drank of a night when I got home to this bloody hideout. You know, the bloke who knew me best in the entire neighbourhood was the guy who ran the off licence. Because I'd be in there refueling every couple of days. I bet. And, and, and I, I became a monster. My girlfriend left, and quite rightfully so, because I was just falling apart and becoming hugely unpleasant. Mm. And eventually, I had a catastrophic mental health breakdown, so much so that I was placed eventually in a lock-in psychiatric ward. And I spent three and a half weeks there um, before they kind of got the meds right and, and I was discharged. But I wasn't discharged, I was released. I was a long, long way away from having good mental health and it's been a battle over the years and all that kind of stuff. But my mental health is robust these days. I'm very happy to report. But yeah, you know, you don't get over a, a breakdown like that by having three and a half weeks in hospital and then come out right as rain as if nothing had happened. It don't work that way. But yeah, and that, of course, signalled the end of my police career because I couldn't work any undercover anymore. I limped on for a few years, you know, doing bits of surveillance and intelligence gathering and all that kind of stuff. But when all that came to an end and they posted me back to a police station, I couldn't hack it. Too heavily stigmatised. My reputation preceded me. People were very, very wary of me. Suddenly I couldn't get passwords, couldn't get access computers. Um, and it was impacting on my mental health once again. I drove out of that police station one night and all I could see was the white of my knuckles, you know, the, the glare. They were so white because I was gripping the steering wheel so tightly. And I got home to, uh, to my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and she'd stuck with me kind of this. I'd, I'd met her when I was in witness protection. So after the girlfriend that moved in witness protection with me had left, you know, some weeks later, some months later, I met this other girlfriend who um, remarkably stayed with me throughout the breakdown. And 25 years later and two kids were still together. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, you know, this is just, this is going to make me ill again, all this stress. And mm -hmm. and so that was, that was me and the Metropolitan Police part in well, our way. In a way is sometimes just the, best thing for for our for our soul isn't it you know that stress is just it's so wrong to put human being and, and the workplace does that you know especially corrosive damaging yeah oh awful awful yeah. could have claimed my life mm. you know i was that ill you know on, on one occasion um, you know, I bought a rope and I was standing in the loft and, you know, one end of it was tied to the rafters of the roof and all of that. So, mm. yeah, it's, uh, you know, but there's a level of, of stress, of course, which I think is manageable and inspires you and gets you out of bed in the morning and all that kind of stuff. Perhaps I'm being clumsy with my language here. Perhaps I should use the word like motivation, perhaps, rather, rather than stress. But... Uh, Corrosive, overwhelming, unbearable stress is is so so damaging. Yes, I tell you what is a funny thing. Well, funny is probably not the right word. But before we had this conversation, it never really occurred to me. We're we're both two professionals that have had to check under our cars to make sure no one's trying to kill us that day. <laughs> yeah. 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 Indeed. Any 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 serviceman. Um, who served well when I did probably all all from the 70s 80s 90s early 90s it, it was the done thing you checked under your car in the morning to to check the IRA hadn't put a bomb underneath it and and they did um, yeah. not not so many uh, not so many squaddies cars in the UK they tended to go for the the kind of public places, didn't they? The pubs and and like you said, Harrods, um, with with devastating consequences. Um, yeah. But we were still advised, you know, you check under your car every morning when you pull up to a traffic light. You keep a distance in front of you so you can 
you know, get out, get out of there if someone pull, pulls a weapon on you. <laughs> They're old habits that, that are still with me to this day, that whole defensive driving techniques and always parking with the nose pointing outwards, you know, which irritates my kids sometimes. And the wife, you know, why have you got to reverse into this parking space then? Why can't you just drive nose in and we can go and get the trolley and start shopping a bit quicker? No, no, no. You know, and they're like, well, what kind of quick getaway do you think you're going to have to make from Tesco's dad? You know, all these years later. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm still parking with my nose facing out because, you know, you quite simply never know what circumstances might arise. And I don't need to be boxed in you know, and, and, and incapable of reacting should I have the need to. Peter, what's it like if you're forming a relationship, you're undercover, you're forming a relationship with a criminal, and it, a big part, as we know, of relationships, you've got to be bloody friendly. You know, you, the, that person, if you're trying to do some undercover deal with them, they got to like you. Very often criminals will take you at first because I've, you know, done a few wrong things in my life. Um, and I remember, you know, not e I remember doing business with in the London underworld. The guy didn't even want any ID. He just looked at me, looked what I had to, for sale and went, yeah, all right, I'll get you some papers. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got, and the, what I'm getting to is what's it like when you have to break your cover when the police swoop, they arrest this guy and he looks at you and goes, you? And realises that, that friendship that you've had, it it was all fictitious. Well, usually by that stage, I'm legging it down the road like a long dog. I am, I am having it on me dancers and I am away. Um, that was kind of be the plan, but sometimes it wasn't. It, that couldn't be achieved. And on other occasions, of course, the next time you might see them would be in court as I go to give evidence. And that sense of betrayal would be palpable. Mm. And um, much as I would ignore them in the dock, of course, at some point, you've got to make some kind of eye contact. That would just be absolutely, frankly, kind of bonkers if you didn't. Um, but I never, I never set out to antagonise and, and what have you, because when you're in a court of law, you want to be believed, you want to be professional, you're going to get up there and tell the truth as much as others will try and contest that, um, and you don't want to be seen there sneering or being immature or anything like that towards the uh, defendants, keep it professional. But a glance towards the, uh, the doc, particularly if prosecution counsel say, Did, can you see that person in the court today? Then you would look and say, yes, that's the man in the doc. Or, you know, that's the man in the middle of three, or that's the man on the left, you know, and, and keep it at that. Was was it ever difficult, though, if you if you genuinely liked the person, or, or did you ever kind of empathise with their situation? Um... Yeah, I, I liked lots of the people that I dealt with, you know, and, and in a different world, if they've made different career choices, life choices, we'd have got on famously and we did get on famously. That's how we managed to get the trade done mm. because we got on and we were businesslike and we'd thrash out the business because there was always difficulties about, you know, where the parcel's going to be delivered to and how it's going to be delivered and how I'm going to receive it and how I'm going to pay for it and all that kind of stuff. There are always loads of difficulties and differences of opinion on how that should be done but you learn to negotiate. And some of these people, when the business side of things was absolutely done and arranged and organised for next week or next month, you go and have a drink and you'd have a laugh with them because, of course, they've got a pretty irreverent kind of attitude towards life anyway. They're not bound by the constrictions of the law of the land because they trample all over those laws. Mm. So you bet they enjoy a drink and a laugh and someone from the opposite sex, generally speaking. You know, yeah, we had some good times. There were other occasions when I'm, quite frankly, dealing with people that have clearly got 
their issues and they've got a nine mil down the back of their trousers and they are frightening the life out of me or they want me to strip bollock naked, you know, because they're paranoid I'm wearing a wire, you know. So it wasn't always champagne and laughs and dolly birds. A lot of the time it was, you know, pretty, pretty challenging. Um, very challenging, in fact. I, I won't beat around the bush. But I was young, I was fearless, I had a propensity for lying, and I could convince bad guys that I was born and bred in a crime like they were. Mm. When did the whole kind of London or South, South London uh, bank robbery or arm robbery thing come around? I mean, I know it. obviously there were arm robberies in the 60s, 70s, but wasn't it in the 80s? And I'm, I don't know if that's to coincide with cocaine or what, but it really become quite a big thing, didn't it? It, 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 it? it started to die out in the mid 80s as the cocaine explosion occurred in the mid 1980s. And literally, you know, we, we just saw volumes of cocaine that had never been seen before. And people right back from the source countries in South America saw what a lucrative market it could be. You know, and, and in the 80s, all of a sudden, because, you know, I'd been in the cops since 1978. So up until that stage, you know, cocaine was the preserve of the upper classes or your rock stars. Um, it, it, but by the time the end of the 90s had come around, suddenly you got chippies, sparkies, plasterers, you know, and all that, hoovering it up on a Friday night when they finished work. Whereas it used to be Royal Ian Rockstars. Then it suddenly became available to all and the purity started to decrease and, and all that kind of stuff. But then back in those days, you know, armed robbery was a very risky business. Okay, the rewards might be very high. And it was particularly with things like the Brinks Mat robbery over at Heathrow, where they took 28 million pounds worth of gold and cash or something. And there have been other robberies since then that have been. Uh, have been very lucrative, but in and around the mid eighties, late eighties, we, the police, not me, cause I never shot anyone when I was in the cops, although I did carry a gun. Um, yeah, the, the police started shooting armed robbers and they suddenly thought, well, is it kind of worth it? Maybe I'll just go and deal in drugs instead. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of robberies were carried out so that people could get the capital they needed to invest in the cocaine industry and other drugs. But that was it. Mid eighties rise of the cocaine industry and the start of the decline of the armed robbery industry. I'm guessing technology had a played a major factor in that as well, because you had the, you had the die packs, didn't you, that were hidden in the money. You had the, the cameras were cropping up everywhere. Um, yeah. Tracker systems, yeah. yeah, all of that. So the, you know, the the money boxes, as they were called, the security vans, would have tracker systems built into them. Um, they they themselves became more robust. I mean, I was in Dulwich as a uniformed cop one day when the flying squad jumped on a firm uh, near a school in Dulwich, and they drove a crane into the back of the uh, of the money box, the security van. But um, they didn't realise that the flying squad were lying in wait, wearing school caretakers, brown uh, overalls and all that kind of stuff. And they all got nicked and convicted. But, um, yeah, they were very inventive, you know, and, and they were actually, back in the day, the armed robbers, the proper blaggers, the proper pavement artists, you know, and all those other nicknames that they had, they were the, the highest echelon of, echelon of criminality until the drugs explosion. Mm. They were the most revered and respected criminals. Those that were the bank robbers, the security van robbers, that they were the top Johnnies. But then that all started to change. The drug dealers became the kingpins because they had the most money, the most weaponry. And then of course, by the time we hit the nineties, you've got 15 year olds 
with a mobile phone, a mountain bike and a nine mil, and they've got no respect whatsoever for a 55-year-old former armed robber. They'll put a bullet in them as, you know, without any compulsion whatsoever. So that, again, kind of began to, to signal the, the very shifting sands that organised crime was now built upon. What are we faced with now? What's the... I mean, you're hearing in London about these acid attacks and, and kids on mopeds. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot of crime has gone underground, i.e. kind of business crime, if that's probably not the right word, but, you know... Online. In- online. On- yeah. A lot of crime has gone online. Yeah, it has. Um, Cybercrime, of course, and the authorities haven't really got a handle on the scale of that, I don't think, um, because the police don't investigate it anymore. You know, if Mrs. Miggins gets defrauded, you know, who investigates it? Sadly, it's it's really, really poor. And they haven't got... The, the, the banks, the police, the government, there's not the political and the practical will to really get on board this and try and tackle it at the moment, unfortunately which is very disappointing because it affects so many of our most vulnerable people and they're getting scammed left, right and centre by these unscrupulous pieces of garbage. Mm. But overall, we we have a tide of teenage bloodshed now, which has been flowing for many years and could be avoided, should be avoided. And as crime moves online, as it has done, as it inevitably will do, as other crimes like human trafficking and the enslavement of of individuals becomes more prevalent and a higher priority for law enforcement, um, there's a simple solution which will tackle so much of it. Perhaps not a simple solution, but there is a solution. And that is, you know, I've, I've, I've dedicated most of my work in life to the war on drugs. We've been fighting the war on drugs for 50 years now. Mm. And it is a war that simply cannot and will not be won, ever. It's a nonsense. Einstein said the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, that's what law enforcement across the globe has been doing for 50 years. Throw in trillions of dollars, euros, pounds, yen, whatever you like, at the issue... And simply nothing has changed. No. Our prisons have got full to bursting point. Millions of people have died unnecessarily. Gangsters have got rich and violence has become a currency. All of that can be changed if we legalise and regulate the industry. That is what we have to do. Yes. Yes, of course. And um with all these things that become status quo, you're forgetting, you know, society forgets all the people in the, those various chains and networks that are making an awful lot of money off, you know, this war on drugs. There's people selling equipment, people f- selling equipment to the police, to the armies, to the drug agencies. There's, there's, the, there's the control where this consignment's going to get busted, but this one's going to slip through and then who's controlling that. And we, we saw the drugs, didn't we come out of Central America under Reagan's administration shipped by the CIA or, or dark elements, of the CIA into America in vast quantities. Um, While well, Nancy Reagan was banging on about just say no. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, what, a, how successful has that campaign, campaign been? Not at all. It's a supply and demand business and the demand simply will not go away. It's a very human thing to alter your state of mind. You, you will have done it today by having a run, I suspect, you know, I will have already done it by having a cup of coffee and foolishly smoking. Don't smoke kids. It's a mug's game, expensive, filthy, smelly, life shortening and antisocial. Don't do it. Um, you know, you, you go to the cinema, 
You want to alter your mental state. You turn the tel TV on to watch a drama or a play or sing or a record. People want to alter the state of their brains. It's part of what makes us human. And of course, some people choose to do it through illegal drugs, and they always will. The demand simply will not go away. And the only people that can supply you those drugs and run the industry are bloody criminals. Would we let the criminals run the, the railways? Would we let the criminals run the NHS? All right, I know what some of you are going to say, right? This is YouTube, we'll get booted off, right? You know, but would you? You know? Yeah, of course, of course. The only person, the only people that sell drugs are criminals. Some of them are doing it under duress and have been criminalised by criminals to do it. Mm. You know, this is about harm reduction. There is so much harm being caused by illegal drugs. Now, I know what people are going to say. No, 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 Pete, you got it all wrong. No, I'm not saying drugs harm everybody because I know the overwhelming majority of people are not problematic drug users. They have a joint, they have a line, they drop a pill, and it impacts upon them not one jot, apart from the fact that they have to pay criminals for it, right? Mm. I get that. But there are many, many, many vulnerable people out there being exploited by crooks, suffering unimaginable harm. And if we wrestle that industry away from them, and so we tax it, we legalise it, we regulate it, it will change the landscape of our nation and the world for the better. It most definitely will. No longer will you have contaminated batches of tablets or heroin, for example, claiming a clutch of young lives. We all hear these stories, don't we? You get it from time to time. You know, the police put out a warning. Half a dozen youngsters die in this city because it's a contaminated batch of ecstasy. Or, you know, a number of, of people die because of a contaminated or too powerful batch of heroin. That'll be gone. No longer will it be an act of teenage rebellion to take drugs because the drugstores will need to be open 24-7 and on our high streets, and they will be, right? So you imagine a teenager that wants to rebel, wants to have a joint. So they go to the drugstore. Let's say they're 18. They go to the drugstore. It's an act of late teenage rebellion on a Saturday night, and in the same queue of the same drugstore is their granddad who wants to get a joint so he can chill out while he watches Strictly. Right? How rebellious is that, teenager? It ain't, is it? It becomes mainstream. We can all do it if we want to. Mm. How, many, how many kids, you know, are going to be standing in dimly lit pub car parks buying a bit of gear off a bloke with a blade down the back of his trousers? or a nine mil, mm. who actually wants them to buy more drugs and more addictive drugs because he wants to be selling to them every day of the week. You go into my drug stores, you know, which will be because we have to beat the, the gangsters on price, purity and availability. So it's got to be cheaper. It's got to be better gear and you've got to be able to get it 24-7. Then you leave the crooks with nowhere to go. Right, absolutely no wriggle room. Um, and you go into those stores and you get advice. Like you get the written instructions when you buy a packet of paracetamol. You'll know where it's been ma manufactured, what the strength of it is, what the recommended and safe dosage is. Yes. It'll happen. It'll happen. Maybe not in my lifetime, although when I'm feeling particularly optimistic. I go on social media and connect with some of my friends who are absolute giants in the world of drug law reform. A bloke called Neil Woods. He's called Woodsy on, on Twitter. Mm. Um, you know, and other great people like Steve Rawls and uh, UK Leap, which is an organisation, um, which is Law Enforcement Action Partnership. 
They're, they're, they're around the world. It's full of cops and former cops and other people from law enforcement campaigning for drug law reform. You know, and it, and it will come around definitely in my kids' lifetimes and, and hopefully in mine. But it's going to take courageous politicians. Um, there are certain um, media outlets which need to get real um, instead of propagating fear and myths and lies. And that's, uh, that's all that. That's all of them, Peter, isn't it? <laughs> no, there are some very credible media outlets out there that I've had the great pleasure of working with over the years. But there are some other scandalous um, outlets that I wouldn't give any time of day to. Hmm. Very much so. Peter, listen, you've been absolutely fascinating. Um, perhaps we can pick this conversation up again at, at, at another time and do a a part two because there's probably a million things that that um more more that i'd love to ask you um for people that haven't read your work which which book would you recommend that they read first please read my most recent book okay which is called manhunt now i and you can also listen to our podcast which is called Manhunt Finding Kevin Parl, P-A-R-L-E. It is on the BBC Sounds platform and other platforms. The last 19 months of my life have been dedicated to finding six foot six Liverpudlian Kevin Parl, who's wanted in connection with two separate and ghastly murders. The first murder in 2004 of Liam Kelly, a 16 year old boy a kid, a child, denied the opportunity to grow, to mature, enter manhood, find a partner, have a family to provide for, gunned down in the street. Kevin Powell is unconvicted of both these crimes, but very much wanted for both of them. Mm. The second, the blasting to death, also with a shotgun, and here's Liam and Lucy, of 22-year-old Lucy Hargreaves, a mother of three young children. There's Liam. Lucy has been described to me by people who knew her as being as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside. A truly horrific crime. Her house was set on fire after she had been blasted with the shotgun. Her partner was upstairs asleep with their youngest child, a two-year-old. The other two kids were with their grandparents. A ghastly crime that has made people in Liverpool break the golden rule, which is you don't talk to the police, you don't grass. Lucy was an entirely innocent, beautiful young woman. And trust me, people have been talking to me and I still want people to come forward and talk to me. If you go to peterblexley.com, that's my website, you know, you can find all the links to the books there and the podcast and a recent update on my investigation. My investigation hoovers up virtually all my waking moments and some of my sleeping moments again. Kevin Powell must be found. Kevin Powell will be found because this is about right over wrong. This is about truth over lies. And this is about a sense of justice. He needs to stand in a court and answer the allegations made against him. Justice, I believe, is the cornerstone of our society. And when things are unjust, it's it's not good. It no. leaves a trail of, of, of damage behind. So please um, check, you know, I'm on all social media, virtually Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all as Peter Blexley, B-L-E-K-S-L-E-Y, peterblexley.com. Um, I've got a burner phone. If anybody knows any information about Kevin Powell, which never leaves my side, um, 07908 617 He will be found. It's not about Kevin Powell, and it's most definitely not about Peter Blexey. It's about Liam and Lucy, a kid and a mother a child and a mother. That's what it's about. You'll get your man, mate, won't you? Here's hoping. He's been on the run for over 16 years 
and I've been hunting him for 19 months. But um, I, there are only two things that will stop me hunting Kevin Powell. Number one is his capture. Number two is my death. Hmm. Yes. Peter, thank you so much. Stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I, when I click off record. But um, my gosh, what a life. Thank you for <laughs> enlightening us all to, to these uh, elements of it. And uh, yes, I shall look forward to watching Hunted. <laughs> well listen to our podcast manhunt finding kevin powell listen to that first i'm looking That's really forward. current and contemporary and it's coming back the bbc have commissioned more episodes so as soon as i can put more stuff in the public domain it it, it, it will be back brilliant and to all our friends at home much love to you all look after yourselves if you could like and subscribe that's going to help and we'll see you next time ciao ciao Hello friend, I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall, I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system onto other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.